in the second of these programs on the Cyprus emergency, I shall be talking again to two of the senior officers who were most closely involved with the command and control of the early stages of the Cyprus emergency. Lord Harding, Field Marshal Lord Harding, as Sir John Harding, was then the Governor and Commander-in-Chief. And his Chief of Staff and Director of Operations was Brigadier Baker, now Field Marshal Sir Geoffrey Baker, but known, of course, throughout the Army more familiarly as George Baker. In the first of the two programs, we talked about the history of the emergency and some of the immediate operational lessons that could be drawn from it. In the second of these two programs, we're going to discuss some of the wider implications of internal security operations. But before we do, I want to go back to Cyprus for a moment and ask you what your opinion was of your immediate adversaries. What was your view, Lord Harding, of Archbishop Makarios? Well, the Archbishop uh, was a highly intelligent and articulate man. Uh, he was head of the Greek Orthodox Church in Cyprus, and in that capacity he was not only the spiritual head, he was their political leader as well, the ethnarch as they call it. He had behind him 500 years or more of experience of political intrigue in maintaining the integrity of the Greek Orthodox Church against Muslim uh, opposition and oppression. And his main motivation, in my opinion, was power. He wanted to have the power to bring about Ennesis, which was the aim of the bulk of the Greek Cypriot population of Cyprus. They wanted union of their island with the Kingdom of Greece. And in the course to that objective, he decided uh, early in 54 or 1954-55 to employ Grievous uh, as an agent to carry out a campaign of insurrection and terrorism in pursuit of Venice. Would you say that he was a sincere man? He was sincere, I think, in his uh, dedication to the cause of Venice. But of course he did change that position later on. So his sincerity, genuine insert sincerity, I would put in doubt. Would you Power was his main motive. Did you see any, uh, or do you see now rather than did you see, any inconsistency between his position as ethnarch, as the head of the church, and his employment of violence as an instrument for achieving his political ends? Well, in my opinion, yes, because uh, I hold the view very strongly that no one is justified in resorting to violence based on spiritual uh, and other considerations in pursuit of political ends. I want to come back uh, to that question in a moment because I think this, this uh, great uh, conundrum about the validity of using violence in pursuit of political aims is very valid to a lot of current political problems. But before I do, can I ask you, Field Marshal, about your immediate adversary, mm. which um, if Makarios was uh, Lord Harding's, then presumably General George Grivas was yours. What is your assessment of him as a commander, as a guerrilla commander? He was undoubtedly extremely efficient, absolutely ruthless. He'd organized his campaign very carefully. He, it was on very much the, the cell basis, where only those within the cell knew what other cells were up to. He was held as a hero by the young, this uh, terrorist youth movement, which he started under Makarios's direction a year before. They regarded him as the great white chief, uh, and it is through his direction that they started to teach these youths first uh, in throwing pamphlets about and, and reporting information secondly in throwing bombs about and latterly if they were good enough they were given a gun. So far as the guerrilla fighting in the mountains was concerned uh, those who know Cyprus will agree with me that the mountains of Trodos and Kyrenia are absolutely custom built for guerrilla fighting. It couldn't be better. But as an opponent as I say he was strong, efficient and ruthless. I remember a case where one of the terrorist mountain gangs was caught 
who had fairly recently been shot through the foot by Grivers. Not that this man had disobeyed an order of Grivers, but merely that he hadn't jumped quickly enough to that order. Mm. He was that sort of a guy. We had a feeling uh, on the ground, uh, my soldiers and I, that the Eoka fighters themselves were not really terribly good, mm. you know. They always used to set their ambushes a little too far from the roads, and uh, they never seemed to be terribly anxious to engage in any ki kind of close combat, although that may, of course, mm. be the technique of the guerrilla. Um, did you regard, from your position, Aoka as an effective military force in the, in the, in the guerrilla sense? I think one's got to separate those working in the mountain gangs to the assassin squads in the towns. Now, taking the latter first, the assassin squads in the towns always looked for a soft target. They would shoot in the back and run away. And in those very narrow streets in places like Nicosia, they could usually get away with it. And, of course, the population was intimidated, and therefore getting evidence was almost impossible, particularly in the early days. In the mountains, I don't think they were particularly courageous, no, I think I would agree. But maybe in some respects they were more afraid of uh, Grievous uh, <laughs> than they were <laughs> of anything else. But uh, they improved as time went on. Mm. Well, now, Lord Harding, coming back to something you said earlier and really leading into the, the really deep uh, implications of this whole problem, you said that you had doubts about the use of violence and terrorism as an instrument for achieving political aims. Could you develop that a bit? I mean, do you think there is no circumstance in which the use of violence in the pursuit of political ends is justified? Well, no, I think I don't, uh, I, I don't think there is, unless there is direct and clear and active uh, physical oppression. Then I think uh, anyone is justified in resisting that. But uh, I think you uh, have got to, if you want to make a change in the uh, style and form of government of the country in which you live, then you've got to employ what I what would pop now popularly call the ballot box rather than the bullet. That is a view I hold very strongly indeed. What you said a moment ago uh, indicates that you are somewhat in favour of what is known as the doctrine of tyrannicide. That is, if a tyrant is too oppressive, the people have the right to overthrow him. But would you agree that the line is drawn when people start using violence indiscriminately and especially against innocent bystanders? Oh, yes, most certainly I would. I think that that, that is never justified. It can't possibly be justified either uh, in Christian ethics or, or in any other sort of uh, philosophy of life. It, it's anti-social, uh, anti-civil, anti-human. Did you uh, consider that the operations of Aoka in Cyprus came under this heading of indiscriminate violence against innocent people? Well, I think it developed that way. Yes, I think it did. Uh, and I think this is what normally happens you get a revolutionary or, or, or an insurrectionary movement which may start from, uh, well, perhaps uh, understandable uh, and justifiable grievances, but then uh, which they try and reject and redeem and, uh, and redress by means of violence, which again I wouldn't agree with. But then gradually they, they uh, have to establish a position and get their aims uh, completed and achieved, and this leads from one thing to another, so eventually any sort of insurrectionary or terrorist movement becomes indiscriminate. Right, now we have to um, come now, I think, to the crux of this whole thing in the philosophical sense, in the intellectual uh, address of the problem, and that is um, how you deal with this, how you deal with violence as an instrument of achieving political aims. We very often hear people say now, especially in the context of something like Northern Ireland, which is, after all, an internal security problem, there is no military solution to this problem. This has always seemed to me to be a rather curious statement because I've uh, tended to the belief that you can't get a political solution until there is a military solution. And I'd like to know what you both think about this. Do you believe that once there is what we would call in 
military terms, an internal security situation. In other words, uh, an insurrection or a, or a situation of terrorism. Do you believe that there can be a political solution without some kind of military solution? No, I don't believe, I don't believe you can achieve a, military, a political solution unless and until you have convinced the people who resort to terrorism and violence that they cannot achieve their political aim that way. And this is the function of the security forces. I don't think the security forces in themselves can achieve a political solution, but they can pave the way to one. Mm. They, can, they, can make the, they can set the stage for one. And unless you set the stage right, unless you pave the way by making certain that the, the uh, insurrectionary organization are convinced that they cannot achieve their political aim by violence and insurrection, uh, you won't get a political solution. Right, now, I know it's difficult to generalize, and one will inevitably find oneself talking about specific situations, but how far are you prepared to go to achieve your military uh, solution, paving the way to a political solution? For, for example, are you prepared to consider curfews on the civilian population, capital punishment for terrorism? How far are you prepared to go in uh, changing the lives of a civilian population in order to achieve a military solution? I think you've got to be prepared to go a great way in defeating uh, the uh, terrorist organization in order to uh, make, convince them that they cannot achieve their political aim through violence. You've got to be very firm and quite ruthless with them in dealing with them as insurrectionaries. Mm. And in other words, you have got to employ all the um, accepted means or known means of uh, uh, curfews are uh, questionable. I mean, a curfew for security reasons is justified. A security for a curfew for uh, punishment reasons, in my opinion, doesn't affect anything. Mm. The same way uh, I introduced the flogging in the Cyprus, but it wasn't in keeping with the way of life, the style of life, the Greek philosophy and so on, and it achieved no purpose at all, so I withdrew it. Uh, what I did do uh, on the death penalty was I introduced, I made it mandatory on the courts to impose the death sentence on anyone found guilty in the courts of being in possession of arms, ammunition or explosives. And that had the greatest effect of anything that I did on the activities and the uh, enthusiasm, if you like, or the, consolid or the solidarity of the, uh, of the terrorist organization. Did you have, uh, as governor, the right to commute a death penalty? Yes, I had, I had the, uh, the royal prerogative. Now, the royal prerogative is, is very specific in its terms, and it says that in, exec in uh, an exercise of the royal prerogative, which is vested in any governor of a British crown colony, uh, that the person concerned should have give full consideration to the public and the private factors involved. Now, this means uh, that you consider the current situation, you consider the, sit the position of the individual concerned in your decision as whether to commute or confirm the sentence of death. Actually, I confirmed the sentence of death in eight cases. I uh, didn't confirm the sentence of death in another case because of a public factor, and, and ever since I've regretted it, because the chap concerned committed a mur another murder, uh, uh, and more than another murder, mm. afterwards. Field Marshal, uh, uh, please. Uh, just a, a footnote of what John has said here. One can regard, I think, the role of the security forces in such an internal security campaign as to try, it's the aim rather than, rather than the role, the aim is to try and achieve a situation where men and women can speak, act and write freely and without fear. And while there's intimidation as there was in Cyprus, this was completely impossible. You've got to produce that situation before you can really go into what we call a most reasonable democratic yeah. situation. But there seems to me to be a very clear difference here, and it's, uh, it has arisen out of what you've both said. You have two 
lots of people to deal with, so to speak. You have the active terrorist, the armed mm -hmm. terrorist, upon whom, as you mm -hmm. rightly say, the full rigors of the law should be visited if he can be caught, and the full weight of the security service sh should be brought. But what about the, gener the generality of the population? How much uh, are you prepared to uh, impose upon them in an attempt to separate them mm -hmm. from the active terrorists? Field Marshal. This is a very delicate question of balance. Every action, coming back to Cyprus, every action that the governor took there and through him, the security forces, we were always very alive to the effect that that action would have on the ordinary law-abiding citizen. It's a question very much of balance. But if the law-abiding citizen was in any way implicated, shall we say, or a party to some terrorist offence and would refuse to give evidence, then it was reasonable that he should be a member or a party to some form of collective punishment, maybe. Always bearing in mind what the general political effect would that would be. Uh -huh. But we were very alive uh, to this question of the relationship with the civilian population, and we encouraged the, the soldiers and the other security forces, wherever they possibly could, to play football matches, you know, in time allowed, and to cultivate friendship. Courtesy and friendship, at least courtesy, always combined with firmness was the cry. Uh, and I think we tried to, to walk this very difficult mm. <laughs> tightrope mm. yeah. as reasonably as we could. When this, I this was one of my favorite slogans when I was talking to the troops, that always, in dealing with the civil population, you have to be courteous but firm. Mm. Firm because you may be dealing with a potential terrorist or somebody who's supporting the terrorist. Courteous because this is an essential relationship between the security forces and the civil population. And it's difficult to hold the balance. Yes. I uh, actually uh, fought in two of the internal security campaigns that we've talked about uh, on and off, Malaya and Cyprus. And I noticed a, a, a tremendous difference. I was commanding uh, infantry in both these operations. In Malaya, General Templar always used to make much of the slogan, it was more than a slogan, the principle of the hearts and minds of the mm -hmm. people. If you gained the hearts and minds of the people, you would separate them from the terrorists. When I went to Cyprus, we had a slightly different, this was not when you were there, um, um, Lord Harding, but we had a, a slightly different uh, approach, which was to be very, very tough with the civil population. In other words, not winning their minds and hearts so much as frightening the life out of them and making, them, uh, making it clear to them that if they cooperated with terrorists, they were going to have a very uncomfortable life. Uh, are you able to draw a distinction between these two, or is this a matter of, of, of the situation at the time? Well, I think it's entirely a matter of the situation at the time and the extent to which the, the civil population are involved, either through in sympathy or fear, uh, in the support of the terrorist organization. Uh, in Cyprus, the, the general run of the Greek Cypriot population were either from fear or from sympathy, in favor of the, the, uh, the agitation, the movement, the violence in support of Ennis. But they were completely schizophrenic in this respect, because you talk to any, any Greek Cypriot, you want, he, would, he had no idea. He thought it was the horror of losing his British mm. passport. Oh. But at the same time, or his trade, if he was a trader, his trading position vis-a-vis -vis the United Kingdom, oh. Uh, but all the same, he wanted to be—he uh, wanted to have it both ways. Mm. He wanted to belong to motherland, Greece. He wanted to have his British passport and his right to trade under Commonwealth uh, economic conditions with the UK. Do you want to add anything to that, Field Marshal? Only this, as a footnote. I think it's fair to say that the aim of the security forces in this problem is to achieve a situation where men and women can speak, act, and write freely and without fear. And until that situation is achieved, the proper democratic processes can't function. Now, going back for a moment to one of the, uh, the techniques of this in terms of the use of troops in internal security operations, one of the criticisms that is often made, especially in the context of Northern Ireland, is the, the classic one that troops have to operate with one hand tied behind their backs. 
Uh, when you arrived in Cyprus, um, did you find that there were any clear instructions issued to troops about when, for example, they could open fire or what action they should take in any given situation? No, I don't think there were, but we, we, uh, as soon as we possibly could, we, we produced uh, what I think were clear and positive instructions to that effect. And this is, this is a very important thing to do. Every soldier who faces a terrorist should know exactly what his uh, powers and responsibilities are, both in regard to opening fire and in regard to arrest or detention or anything else. This is, this is a fundamentally important. What were the uh, instructions uh, actually that you issued in Cyprus? What uh, power had uh, a, a soldier on patrol to open fire? Well, there were several things laid down uh, that gave him that right to do so. If he was personally attacked, for example, or a man drew a gun on him, or if he was protecting uh, some important, whatever it might be, uh, place or vehicle or equipment, and if, he th if that was threatened, then he was entitled to it. But coming back to what we call the red card, this very briefly, uh, I asked my G1 to coordinate with the Attorney General and the head of the Army Legal Services and the head of the RAF Legal Services to produce me a draft on this. They came back with four uh, pages, large pages, typed in language which no soldier could understand. Eventually, after about three nights of wrangling, I got those three legal experts together and at the cost of a bottle and a half of Cypriot brandy, I got them to agree to a potted version that I'd made of this. And looking back, I think it was quite a useful document. At least it gave the authority for the soldier, or the airman for that matter, to act. It gave him the legal backing if he did shoot, for example, if he was doing it uh, in, in the course of duty and justified and according to the rules, he would be backed. And that particular document, I got them to introduce to in Aden in a few years later, and a slightly modified version, obviously, to adjust to local conditions, and again in Northern Ireland, and it was the basis of that famous yellow card which reads about. Yes. So it was rather a historic document. I think. In your discussions with the Attorney General, did the uh, question of the culpability of uh, a soldier shooting a terrorist arise? I asked this question mm. because I once shot a terrorist in Malaya, uh, and there ensued a court of inquiry to uh, decide whether I was guilty of culpable homicide or not. I m may say I was cleared, but it did seem to me a rather curious operation. Did you have anything like this in Cyprus? This is something which uh, the governor was extremely careful uh, should be safeguarded, and the emergency regulations, so far as they could, did safeguard that. And the point of this really was is if the soldier or the man was carrying out his duty and in accordance with the rules in his red card which he carried mm. on him, then he would, could not be called culpable mm. of allegedly murder. Yeah. Yeah. He was thereby safeguarded. He was safeguarded in the courts, etc., etc. Uh, a vitally important point mm. for the morale of, of yes. the security yeah. forces. Now, I'd like to broaden this out a bit from the specific lessons of Cyprus and to ask you, Lord Harding, a bit about uh, your more general views on military affairs and on the army and on leadership. You've been a regular soldier for most of your life. What led you, first of all, into the regular army? It was rather an accident. I was working in a London office in a, as a junior civil servant before the First World War, and I fell under the influence of a very keen territorial who persuaded me to work for a commission in his regiment. Uh, which I did, and I was uh, fortunately successful, and I was granted a commission as a second lieutenant in the Territorial Army in May 1914. During the war, I seemed to be getting on better in the Army, and I liked the life in the company, and so when I was asked if I wanted to apply for a regular commission, I did so, and I was granted one, much to my delight and rather surprise. Yes, it's a far cry from the Army of the First World War to Cyprus and internal security operations. Uh, what do you think has changed most in the army in the time that you've been in it? Oh, I think the application of modern technology to the weaponry of the army, to its communications, and to its whole way of life, and the way it conducts its operations. 
Yes, it's obvious, of course, that the army has become a much more technological and mechanized organization than it used to be. Um, what do you think has happened in that context to the requirement for the qualities of leadership, which used to be the basic need in an officer in the army? Is that still, do you think, a major requirement for an army officer? I think it's paramount. And I think so. I think uh, what was it, Napoleon's dictum that men are nothing, the man is everything, still applies to the modern army. It, it's, the, it's the man at the head of affairs who inspires, who enlists the will to serve, who enlists the readiness to make a sacrifice in the common cause. This is all part and parcel of leadership. Well, now, what do you think are the qualities that go to make up leadership? Uh, I believe that you served uh, for some time with Field Marshal Montgomery in the Western Desert, for example, uh, and he had some uh, very uh, clear and in indeed uh, sometimes rather abrasive ideas about leadership. Do you uh, subscribe to some extent to his uh, maxims about yes, the Yes, uh, very much so. He was a teacher at the Staff College when I was a student there, uh, and he taught us um, tactics and battlefield leadership. There were other teachers as well, uh, principally I remember Dick O'Connor, who was in the same category. But I learned a great deal about command and leadership from both of them. And in my view, the essentials really are um, responsibility, the readiness to take responsibility, the readiness to make decisions in difficult circumstances, maybe without I with inadequate information, uh, and then the ability to see those decisions put into effect. Do you think that in order to do that, you have to have a very close relationship with, first of all, let us say, subordinate commanders? How do you feel about the role of a commander-in-chief towards his subordinates? Well, I think you must get to know, any commander must get to know personally uh, the character and capabilities and limitations of everyone who serves under his command, I would say, two down. That's to say, if I'm commanding a division, I would want to make certain that I understood and knew the capabilities, the character, and the limitations of my brigadiers and my commanding officers. And similarly, as the way it goes on. Yeah. And you want to know equally uh, a, a good deal about all the rest of them. But primarily, it's, it's knowing and having a clear understanding and being able to communicate with and get the best effort out of everyone within your command what I call two down. Now what about this um, great question of being what is sometimes called a good butcher? If you find that you have, uh, uh, perhaps through no fault of your own, a subordinate who is not up to the job, do you uh, believe in uh, quite ruthlessly getting rid of him? What would be your attitude? Uh, to well, my philosophy, which I've developed over my years, is this. That if I have a subordinate commander who is not coming up to what I require of him, I uh, first of all send for him, tell him where his, what his shortcomings are, and then I give him a period of time to put them right. Uh, maybe a day, it may be a week, it may be a month, according to the situation and the circumstances. And, and that if he fails to do that, then I seek to get him replaced. If, on the other hand, I've got somebody under my command who's doing positive harm, then I get him out at once, regardless of uh, the situation. Now, this question of getting people out uh, is, I think, sometimes a question of, um, of, of the suitability of officers for certain roles. There is the classic conflict, which has existed uh, certainly since I joined the army, between the staff and the commander. Mm. You know that old, uh, that, that poem, I think it was Siegfried Sassoon's, wasn't it, about scarlet majors at the base speeding glum heroes up the line to death, mm. which is the classic yeah. view of the regimental officer of the staff yeah. officer. Do you think that there is a, a, a clear distinction between the requirements of a staff officer and the requirements of a commander in the field? Well, I think, uh, I would put it this way, I think there are some people who do better as staff officers and others who do better as commanders. The ideal is to have somebody who's ambidextrous. I uh, am fortunate in that respect in that I've had experience of being a staff officer and a commander at uh, a number of different levels. Do you think that there's anything to be said for introducing into the British Army or the British forces generally the old German concept of the general staff in which you had professional staff officers who were always on the staff and commanders who were always in the field? 
No, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't subscribe to that philosophy at all. I think you, you must have people on the staff who, can, who know and understand the views and the attitudes of the regimental officer and the soldier. And you must have commanders who know how to work a staff machine. So I think the two have got to be interwoven. I don't think you can separate. I think this is a great mistake to try and separate the mm. two. Uh, and uh, going back to what you said about the staff, there's an old uh, doggerel, a bit of doggerel. Uh, uh, the bread is the staff of life, but the life of the staff is one long loaf. <laughs> yes. Broadening it even further, and taking in both the staff officer and the regimental officer and the commander, what do you regard as the role of the soldier, of the military establishment, in society, in a dem democracy like ours? Well, I think first and foremost, the role of the private soldier is to make his greatest personal contribution uh, to the efficiency, uh, the way of life, uh, including the sporting activities uh, of the unit to which he belongs. And in doing that, he is making his biggest contribution to the defense of our country and our interests overseas, uh, and in being ready and able to play his full part in support of the civil power or in dealing with a situation like we had to deal with in Cyprus and so on. Mm. But do you think that we have at the moment, for example, the balance about right in terms of the role that the soldier plays in the life of the community as a whole? There was a time when the soldier was really in a kind of ivory tower. Yeah. He was set apart from mm. the rest of society. Then throughout the years of national service, uh, the soldier became much more a part of society as a whole. Uh, we've now given up national service, and perhaps we could have a word about that in a moment, but do you think we've got the balance right at the moment about the, the, the contribution the soldier and the officer makes to the overall life of the community in which he lives? I think it's about right at the moment because I think that uh, operations in Ulster uh, have a big bearing on this, and the general public know about what the part the army is playing, and they are sympathetic and interested uh, I think there is always a danger when you have a voluntary army, purely voluntary army, of, of, a, of a segregation uh, of the army from the civil population. And this I would strongly deplore. I think we've got to do everything we can to make sure this doesn't happen. Mm. I mean, if I may give you an example, uh, uh, way back before the war, my wife was looking for a, a, a housemaid and, and we got an, an answer to a, a, re a reference an application to saying that the, the, the good woman was very interested in the post, but she'd always been advised by her mother not to take a position in a public house or with the military. <laughs> well, you've got to get away from that. We, we've got to make sure we don't go back to that yeah. uh, situation. And um, this means that you've got to have, the, you've got to create a general interest in the public, in the army, you've got to make the mm. army uh, make its... Uh, well, its problems, its views, and its interests and attitude known to the general mm. public. Field Marshal, we mentioned national service a moment ago, and I, I said, and I think it's right, that we've had more difficulty about that business of keeping the army in the eye of the rest of the community since the end of national service. And I know that you were uh, quite closely involved with the period of the army in which we did mm. give up national mm. service. Um, Looking back on it now, would you like to see some form of national service brought back? This is a very difficult question. I would like to see a form of national service, not necessarily military, brought back. I would like to think that the majority of young men of today would not only benefit themselves, but would the nation would benefit if they could be usefully employed, instructed in some clearly beneficial type of work. Mm -hmm. I mean, quite apart from the services, civil defense, something which I feel very strongly uh, should be brought back to being a reasonable and mm -hmm. much more efficient organization. Yeah. Disaster relief. You can think of several examples. How you set about training that, organizing, setting it up, well, I honestly haven't mm -hmm. given any thought to it, but this is what I'd like to see. Mm -hmm. I think most of the young men would appreciate it. And I think it would do them a lot of good, quite honestly. It, it's after all, uh, uh, the country does not owe them a living. And oh. this would maybe give them a, a greater sense of responsibility. Now, we've strayed 
a long way from Cyprus, but I think not, uh, not uh, in too irrelevant a way. But to come back to Cyprus and its lessons for a moment, as governor and commander-in-chief in Cyprus, what lessons did you learn that you think might be useful to present-day officers if they should ever be faced with a situation like that again? What would you extract as the principal lessons? It's a difficult question, Alan, but I, I think that, the, first of all, I, I would make the point that I made earlier on, uh, that um, there must be uh, total involvement from top to bottom, both in the armed forces and with the civil administration and with the police force. They must learn to work with each other, they must learn to trust each other, uh, and, and to have friendships and, co uh, and good relations with each other because they have to work together. That, I think, is the fundamental thing at every level. Uh, then I would say that um, whatever they do, uh, they, they must be have established the best possible relations that they can with the civil population of the country in which they're operating. They must be courteous and fair in their dealings and firm in their dealings with the civil population. Uh, they, they, they must... Um, maintain the highest standard of discipline. And by discipline, I mean behavior within the, in, within the military code, uh, both within their units and, and in their dealings outside their units. And there, they must, uh, there must be tremendously high morale in all the forces. I think, in my experience, uh, the uh, cooperation between the three services and the morale of all of them was higher in Cyprus than I've ever known them anywhere else. And that I attribute to the fact that we were all shared a common purpose. Did you, um, Field Marshal, feel that in this effort that you and Lord Harding were very close in your relationship as Governor and Commander-in-Chief and Chief of Staff and Director of Operations? Did I felt this most did you strongly. Did you? You did. Uh, most strongly. And if I may say so, the one really strong memory I have of those days was a fantastic example. A fantastic is not putting it too highly of the leadership that we had from John. Uh, well, now you've heard his views on the role of the army, mm. uh, the Cyprus, the lessons of the Cyprus operations, the qualities of leadership. How do you think he measured up to all this? Exemplary. <laughs> Full <laughs> marks. You see, You're too flattered. The, no, I'm not. <laughs> One of the, the, the fundamental thing that was lacking in Cyprus when John went there uh, was leadership. Of all things, there was no direction. Now, he inspired, first of all, confidence. He found out the situation. He listened to people. He talked to them. In the light of what he's heard, his information, he made decision. Decision was then implemented, and then the, the implementation was checked at all levels by many ways, including personal visits from John around the island. This inspired people in a way that many of them had not been inspired before. Now, in the services, we're used to leadership. I think probably it's true to say the standard of leadership is higher than in any other organization, but the civil administration and the police there had never known anything like it. And the welding of all these entities together for the common purpose was some very dramatic thing for me. And in fact, when eventually John had to leave, I can say it quite truthfully, strong men broke down and cried. You're too kind. <laughs>